Uh, Ryan, thank you so much. Five bucks. You're very uh, James Dama. You're very bullish on the future of LLMs, uh, large language models. Is Tesla your best bet for the largest beneficiary of these predicted improvements? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, um, so Tesla, like as we we were talking about the you know language of lanes thing, that in a sense that's Tesla using some technology that comes out of the LLM you know, transformer space. It's not an LLM. The, the, the underlying technology is really similar. So they do benefit from that. Most of the FSD doesn't benefit directly from LLMs. Uh, does Tesla, will Tesla benefit from the existence of LLMs in the world and LLMs happening? Yeah, sure they will. They're, you know, uh, but in a lot of ways, te Tesla benefits in a similar way to the rest of the world, right? Like these things, they just leverage your people in a really significant way. LLMs are less useful for the underlying problems of FSD, which is Tesla's biggest sort of AI related lever today. Now they can use LLMs in other aspects of their business, um, but it's not an, it's not a, a, like a drop in huge benefit for them in the same way that it is for say Google, uh, you know, because Google's world is virtual, it's textual and that kind of stuff. Or if you're a company that has, you know, if you have a website and tons of users and you have a problem like, you know, finding spam, like LLMs, they, they, they're they like a direct and immediate solution to a big problem that you have. Longer term LLMs have, they're going to end up having a lot of other, uh, a lot of other uh, impacts. And LLMs, they're going to push everything else forward too. Like a lot of the stuff we learn in LLMs gives us insight into everything else that we do. So a lot of the, so in, in a lot of indirect ways, Tesla really does benefit, but I wouldn't say that they're the obvious beneficiary of, uh, of the advancement of LLMs at this point. That said, I feel like Tesla is one of the, in my mind, in my opinion, they're one of the, more straightforward and significant beneficiaries of the advance in neural network tech, uh, and explaining that is a little bit more com uh, a little bit more complicated. But uh, it has to do with the nature of Tesla as an invest as an investment, which is that they have this core. Like essentially, the AI stuff is this huge lever for Tesla, which uh, is a essentially a free call option because, in my opinion. Tesla doesn't get valued as, as a tech company or as an AI company. They get, they get, they're getting valued as, uh, as a car company, which is an up and comer right now. Like it's growing really fast. It's going to take, like, I feel like Wall Street is no longer assuming that, uh, that Tesla is going to be an also ran, you know, five years from now. Like they see Tesla having a significant impact. They don't see Tesla like having, you know, a fleet of robo taxis uh, that, you know, out there uh, doing transportation as a service. And the reason I can say they don't do that is because, well, if they do think that they can't do math <laughs> because <laughs> the number is much, much bigger than the stock price implies right now. If that wants <laughs> Not that financial advice. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I wouldn't say that they're an obvious direct beneficiary of LLMs, but they will benefit and they will benefit disproportionately as an investment, as these technologies roll out because of the because of the nature of their business. They are actually quite AI heavy company, like maybe one of the most AI heavy companies. Awesome. Thank you so much, James, for that awesome uh, answer. Ryan, thank you so much for the super chat. Let's do the next question. And yes, I timed it perfectly. Christopher, thank you so much. Another $10 super chat. Hey, Farzad, I'm the duck rice farmer from Investor Day. I remember you, man. We met at Clive, I'm pretty sure on the bottom on the bottom floor. How you doing, brother? I'm wondering your thoughts on FSD adoption only needing to hit a minimum saturation point before we see exponential gains for overall road safety. Yeah, I'm so let me I'm wondering your thoughts on FSC adoption only needing to hit a minimum saturation point before we see exponential gains for overall road safety. I mean, the, the way I think about it, and James, help me think about this, uh, too. And if you have any thoughts here, I think the 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 question of the full self driving system being better than a human, it, I feel like that that is like not even a question that we have to doubt because it seems like the trajectory is very much going there and in some ways if i think about how the system behaves today with my supervision and data has you know T tesla has data back in the sub is that it's far safer i mean it does it it, it doesn't really 
you know, it does do stupid things. But in general, when you're thinking about where people do stupid things, the system does a lot less stupid things in those situations, which I think is why overall it's safer than a human with supervision. So I'm I'm wondering, you know, the way I'm thinking about its adoption and sort of hitting that critical uh, point is that at some point, the safety of the system is going to be so much safer than a human that regulators are going to have no other option but to adopt the technology because of how many lives it's going to save. I think it's very hard for the regulators to say, hey, there's 30,000 people dying in the United States every year from car accidents, and that's okay. Like, even though this thing might get us down to 10,000, we should wait until it, get us down, it gets us down to 10. I don't see that happening. And I think any sort of perceived uh, improvement on the safety past that point um, I think it's going to be less important than the comfort and how confident people feel in that system because of how comfortable it is to ride in it. How do you think about that uh, sort of question and, and uh, sort of my answer? So the overall yeah. question of like how much FSD does it take to make a difference or the sure. question of like how good does FSD have to be before regulators feel compelled to, uh, I don't know, it's like regulators, they can approve it or disapprove it. I, I it's... Like, I do think we get to a point at, at some point where, you know, people are petitioning Congress to get all the dangerous human drivers off the road, right? And that's where you get, like, it's mandated. People yeah. have to, I don't know at what point that happens. Not for a while yet, considering the kind of yeah, environment that we're in right now. Yeah. Um, there is an interesting thing about injecting self-driving cars or you know, drivers with certain behaviors into a stream of traffic on the first topic. Like, at what point does FSD start changing the dynamics of driving on the highways? Like, it's been known for a long time in the way in traffic flow studies that a relatively small number of drivers that deviate from the behavior of the pack can change the, the dynamic of the entire pack. And you, like, one of the ways you can, you can demonstrate this in a really horrible way, which has been done a couple of times, is you have a you have a fast but smooth flowing highly congested highway and you inject one person driving really badly and now you get a traffic jam right because you've just crossed the critical threshold of laminar flow for this yeah, thing yeah. right and it and it comes to all and the other thing can happen too where you know you have a lot of sort of variation you i mean there's a certain amount of turbulence in traffic that you get and the turbulence contributes to the possibility of getting a jam up and, and turbulence also contributes to accidents and that kind of stuff, right? And one of the things about self-driving cars is they drive in a much more steady and predictable way than people do, mm. which is not to say all people, but you've got some subset of people who, you know, they're, who are not helping the situation. Texas, baby. <laughs> right? There's always, an out, there's always outliers, right? And you have some distribution of velocities and number of lane changes and that kind of stuff. The and entire state of to Texas the is of an outlier. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so the thing is, uh, I don't know what the number is, but it's a it's a, an amazingly small number fraction of the overall vehicles that have to just become very consistent and predictable before the density of the traffic at laminar flow is, can get much much higher. So, like there's there's this interesting sort of flow thing that happens where if you get if you have a a certain concentration, which might be 10% or it might be 3% or something like that, of very consistent drivers in a mix, the whole group becomes much more consistent mm. uh, overall. So uh, it, like, it'll be interesting to see what the dynamics are and if anybody does any studies on those. But I do, I do actually think that, that uh, FSD, it's going to start having that kind of impact before it has the impact of like it's saving everybody's life because everybody's driving on it, right? Uh, it, it, yeah. it, it could have this weird knock on effect where it changes. Like I live in LA and LA, you know, the freeways are nuts in morning rush yeah, hour. Yeah. People drive really fast and they're three feet apart. Right. And there's, you know, the fast lane is the asshole parade. You, know? <laughs> you just, you get these buses of like people who are just, they're really in a hurry to get going. Yeah. So there it's, it's kind of this showcase of irrational behavior, which is not safe. And the thing right. is, it doesn't change. You don't have to inject a lot, very many constraints into the flow of that traffic before people give up on the irrational behavior. And they just like, you know, follow the flow of traffic and get there when everybody else gets there kind of thing. Yeah. And that is, a, that's a safer environment to be in. Yeah. It, it, it's going to be so fascinating to see if there is, if there's a critical 
mass of Teslas on the road on FSD that their behavior would indirectly impact, like it would dire almost directly impact everyone else's behavior because of how safe they're driving. And that creates a just overall safer environment. So just by them existing on the road, it could have a positive effect. That that would be mind blowing to see. And I would love to see if there's any data around that when, if, if and when that happens. All right, let's do a, let's do a few more. Uh, we want to be respectful of James's time here. He's allocated two hours. We'll make sure not to go over that. Ryan, uh, question. Elon said that Waymo's self-driving tech won't scale. Can you elaborate on that and whether you agree or not? So this is sort of the LiDAR multi-sensor system, so on and so forth. Uh, any any insight you can give us? It's, I mean, Waymo will change their system to as they scale out, they will change their system to make it more scalable. The way that they do things now, yeah, I, I do generally disagree. To say it doesn't scale is like going a little bit too far. It doesn't scale as easily. And that's certainly true. The amount of work that you that Waymo needs to do in a certain area in order to get their fleet to operate is much higher than, than the system that Tesla aspirationally is creating would do. Like Tesla, Tesla aspirationally is trying to build a system that's functionally equivalent to a human being in terms of its driving. So it doesn't need, like even if it doesn't have a map, it doesn't need a cellular connection. If something unexpected happens on the road, a tree falls down, there's construction or something like that, it, re, it, it, move, it you know, it responds in the way a human being does with a full sort of, you know, flexible panoply of options and responses and that kind of stuff. Uh, Waymo, Cruise, most of the self-driving systems that are out there, they're actually self-driving today. They have taken a variety of shortcuts in order to be able to get on the street quicker. And those shortcuts, there's a number of them, but they make the system more brittle. And one of the things about brittleness is you have to cover that by doing a lot. You have to lay, do a lot more groundwork before you put the, the vehicles in there. And that takes people, it takes time, and then it takes effort to go on maintaining. So I think what, what Elon's basically saying is, you know, it, uh, Waymo's putting a certain amount of effort into constantly remapping San Francisco so their cars can drive there. And that takes a certain amount of resources, a certain number of personnel, right? Doing that for the whole United States is not going to work right and now of course what waymo will do is they will change their system so they don't need as much of that stuff to make it more accessible and then as they scale out they'll go through urban areas and that kind of stuff so you know waymo the system waymo will they will eventually be doing what tesla is doing you have to you can't have a scaled up system without it like in that sense what they're doing today doesn't scale that doesn't mean that waymo is not going to be successful like i don't agree with that i think Waymo has plenty of potential to be successful if they keep putting resources in, they decide they want to, and they're willing to go with the flow as the technology changes. If they are, I think there's plenty of plenty of space for them to be successful. But yeah, I totally agree with the technical observation that what they're doing today, like you can't scale that to the United States. That's just not going to work. It has to change.